a good overview of the academic and the uh, private practice uh, side of things. And I'm going to go into more about uh, kind of where those two merge, the, the kind of private uh model that seems to be coming out more and more and people seem to be uh, looking for more. Full disclosure, um, I'm in a private practice. I'm here at Campbell Clinic, which is a large uh, multi-specialty orthopedic group. Uh, but we are also the uh, sole providers for orthopedics at University of Tennessee here in Memphis. So I am uh, somewhat skewed towards a private model. Uh, I did f fellowship up in Louisville, Kentucky at Leatherman Spine Center, which is also very much a uh, private type model. Um, so what is private And I mean, I think when most of us think about that, I apologize for the poor graphics there, but um, I think we, we all tend to think it's the kind of merger of academics with the private practice, and it's somewhere in the middle. And I mean, in theory, that, that's great, uh, but in reality, it, it's more something like this. And it's a mess of all, all different inputs uh, beyond just the academic and private practice worlds, and really no two models are similar at all. And I would argue that even Kat and Jim both, and really anybody on this uh, call right now is in some type of a, a private type model. So why, why do we all uh, tend to get into this uh, type of model? Well, I think we go into it, most of us thinking it's the best of both worlds. Um, I mean, you can take really what you want from the academic side and what you want from the private practice side and really kind of merge those two together. I mean, we all went into medicine and surgery and spine surgery excuse uh, my uh, brethren from New Jersey, but um, we all want to be the boss. We all like to be the person that somebody looks at when uh, things are going uh, poorly or when they're going well. And part of the reason is we like to be able to make our own decisions for our practice and our patients. And when those decisions turn out uh, to be the correct ones and things go well, I mean, it's nice to be the one who everybody looks at and applauds. And, and there's not anybody on this call, I think that uh, would hate to be uh, upfront when you're looking at a, a nice payday. Um, with the private model, the fact that it is a private practice also, you a lot of times do get to share in the profits of that group. So if the group has a, a great year, a lot of times at the end of the year, you're getting a bonus for that. Um, and that is certainly appealing, especially when uh, things are going well. Uh, Kat uh, had kind of touched on the resident education part of things. Uh, all of us went through residency. And as you go through, um, some of us kind of gravitated towards teaching residents and enjoyed that and want to keep that as part of our, our practice to kind of give back. And uh, it, it's fun to hang out with surgeons who are in training and teach surgeons in training. Um, and the private model, depending, again, how it's set up, uh, can offer that in some respect or another. Um, and then an another thing with uh, taken from the academic kind of uh, world, if you want to be involved in leadership uh, uh, or produce a lot of research, certainly in the academic uh, sector, that's a lot easier to do. There's a lot more resources uh, to help with that. And as Kat kind of alluded to, you're expected to do that. So for people that are interested in that and want to be in leadership roles, uh, the private model does offer that as well. But then there's always the, uh, the flip side of things where it, it, it could be the best of both worlds, but could also be the worst of both worlds. I mean, it's great to be the boss when things are going well, but then if uh, you're not making the right decisions, you, you're the one that everybody looks at saying, uh, this idiot's uh, running things into the ground and uh, what, what he has no idea what he's doing, what, what, what's going on here. Um, and I mean, that decision tree, it's great when it's all possibilities, but what about when uh, really either decision you make is going to be the wrong one and uh, either somebody's getting fired or you, you can't get the new uh, MRI machine you need? I mean, there, there's unfortunately a lot of tough decisions that go into being uh, the boss, whether you're a boss of one or a boss of uh, 45. Uh, either way, you're still one, one of the people making that decision. And then uh, again, again, with the profit sharing, well, what if uh, COVID hits and you shut down your surgery center and you're, the hospital tells you you're not doing any elective surgery for uh, so many months? Well, your employees still want to get paid. 
uh, but you're not an employee. You're, you're part of the own, ownership. So uh, you, you don't have a salary. A lot of your income may come from productivity or even bonuses. And if there's no money coming in, you're not taking any money out. So th there's always two sides to, uh, to all of that. And then on the other side of it, the residents, I mean, we, we all went through residency. We know some residents are uh, certainly better than others. And uh, as one of my uh, old chiefs used to say, some people would shine better elsewhere. But when somebody puts in a screw uh, that is incorrectly placed, uh, you're the one that has to deal with the patient down the road and answer those questions uh, and see them year in and year out. Um, and that for some people is not something that they want to handle. I mean, Kat sounds like she's a little more liberal with her residents than I am. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm letting a uh, third year resident do C12 fixation uh, right off the bat, whether they tell me they've done it before or not. But um, uh, again, uh, some people are more comfortable with uh, things than others. And then uh, I think Kat touched on this also. I love when people always say, well, yeah, I'll just get an academic job. I really don't mind research. That's fine when you have to do one research project in five years and have it publishable or however it's worded. But when that's part of your contract that yearly you need to produce so much or over so many years you need to produce so much research, that's a much bigger pill to swallow. And when you're financially being uh, compensated or not based on that, that, that really changes the whole deal when I don't mind research becomes a much bigger problem than you, you really think going into it. Um, this is something that I didn't really think about until I, I got into practice here. And again, I, I trained here, but when you're in a private dynamic model and you are the teaching institution, you are thought of in the community and the surrounding area as the referral center. So people that are uninsured or really complex cases, those are gonna be sent to you. Um, which is all, all well and good. And I think that's part of the reason we all get into doing this. But the other side of that is when you need plastic surgery or you need another uh, referral uh, subspecialty, they may also be in private practice and they may not be the referral center. Um, so getting somebody to work with you on a, a complex case is easier said than done a lot of times. Um, and especially where I am here, I operate on a week, I can operate in three different hospitals. Um, and a lot of the groups in town, um, whether, I mean, us, neurosurgery, the other subspecialties, they're doing the same thing. So it's not so easy to get uh, somebody to help out uh, when you have a complex case and need more than just you uh, to do it. Um, and that was something I really didn't think about, but something to definitely keep in mind. Um, and again, along with the, the research and uh, leadership, leadership positions, that, that's a lot of time and dedication you need to put in to do that. And many private practices uh, don't recognize that uh, financially. And if you're taking time away from a practice, that's time you're taking away from productivity. And again, some do, some don't, but it's just something to, to keep in mind. So at the end of the day, uh, again, I would argue that everyone really goes into uh, somewhat of a private, private emic type situation um, making the best or worst of, of that is kind of uh, how you uh, choose what you want and uh, kind of what Jim alluded to. You can talk through things with the people um, who you're going to be joining and kind of make things uh, the way that you want them to be. Um, but you really just have to be honest with yourself and decide, do I really want that to be part of what I do or I really don't want that to be part of what I do. And um, I mean, Kat kind of said this as well, with a hospital or an academic institution, it's a little bit harder of a conversation than it is with a private group a lot of times. Um, but a lot of private groups have uh, some contracts that they're unwilling to bend or break on things also. So um, it's just something that you really need to be honest with yourself and be honest with them. Because uh, once you get into the position, it's a much harder conversation to go back on something that you signed. Excuse me. That was great, Chad. Thanks uh, for basically, I think really, I don't know, Jim, he kind of summarized us. I thought it was perfect because uh, I think it is the best of both worlds. 
Um, can you talk more about what you have decided now that you've kind of been at this for a minute is your balance. If you, you know, you talked about the, the plus and minuses, but how do you balance dealing with your residents, but also having a private practice where you have to maintain a certain decorum and be at two different hospitals with no help and kind of speak to that struggle that I don't think any of us appreciated in training that really truly exists. Well, as I said, I trained here. So it kind of gave me a leg up uh, as far as knowing the system and how things work. Uh, if I had not, I think it would be a much harder system to uh, kind of navigate. Um, but I really leaned on my partners as far as how they do things, because it is a completely different world, uh, when on the attending side of things versus the resident side of things, as far as how you have to do things. And the workload is, I would say not less, but different and, uh, navigating that world was something that I would really wasn't concerned about before. And my partners really kind of helped me figure things out. And I'll be honest, I'm still learning how to do things. And every day I'm figuring out, well, that didn't work. I'm not doing that ever again. Um, but I, I think it's, I, I don't think there's a really a good way to go into it knowing how to, it's a lot of learning as you go and figuring out what you did wrong and asking somebody how they do it correctly, and then just making it your own, I think. So I, I don't know that I, really haven't answered that question yet. Okay. It was kind of a loaded one. It was unfair, but you kind of led me into it. It was awesome. Thanks. Hey, just, you know, spine is, is an area that probably has the largest gray zone of any of the sub you know, it's, it's not like trauma or sports where things are relatively cut and dry. Um, but in spine, uh, you know, you can get a lot of different opinions how important was the role of having a mentor or senior partners in your decision-making um, and, and deciding whether to take a job where you might be the only spine person in a big practice? And the good news is you're going to get all the referrals, but the bad news is, um, you know, you don't have anybody to ask a question to um, versus going into a place where there were senior people around who you knew would scrub with you and help you um, think through some tough cases. And that's, I guess each of you can, tone in on that for me that was always something I, I really looked for and all the practices that i i only looked at i think two or three other ones besides here uh, but i did want somebody who was senior and maybe at least going to be there a couple of years while i was there to be able to bounce things off of and again not necessarily not knowing how to do something in the or but really with the i mean the practice management stuff has been the biggest difficult part for this uh, for me, uh, through all, the whole kind of uh, getting into practice, much more than I thought so. Um, the the OR stuff and seeing people in clinic, really, I mean, you, you get through that. Um, but that for me was a big part of picking a practice was having somebody senior to be able to run things by. And I think my uh, mentors in, in fellowship were, uh, they really echoed that, that that is something that is in, uh, invaluable to have, to be able to talk to somebody about because somebody going to a mentor who you had in fellowship about your practice in Tampa, Florida, a lot of things don't apply. So it's, it's a little bit more of a difficult conversation, I think, as far as the practice management stuff, at least. Have all of you been in the same practice since you started? Because it was very common when we finished, and I speak for the three of us, because each of us have all been in different practices before we landed at TBI. So do you see much switching around either among your peers or have any of you switched since you first started? No, uh, but I have seen, uh, I had a gentleman switch midway through and had to redo his board collection. And that was brutal. Like, that's what I, you know, like they say, stay wherever you're going to stay and at least be there for two years. You know, he had to delay his board collection a year. It was just not necessarily the best idea, but he ultimately came to that decision. And I've, I think it's what 50% of orthopedic surgeons change their practice right. in the first two years after board collection. So um, we're all, we're all brand new. Um, but much back to the, what Dr. Ziegler was talking about, my mentors here, the reason why I'm here 
you know, we talked about how many places that I interviewed, it was almost like being in residency again, I was trying to figure out where I would fit and how that dynamic would help. Um, I have a senior partner who's been practicing for many years and he did private practice before he came here and he's about four or five years from retiring. And he has a different mindset than my partner who is seven years older than me, who um, is very much in the prime of his job and his career and has a different approach to the things. And without either one of them, I would not uh, be here. They a hundred percent give back to my practice and the way that I am the way I am. And they take care of my patients when I'm not here. And I take care of their patients when I'm, when um, they're not here. And I really, that was a hundred percent something I, it was a must for me. And there was one place that I did interview that I loved that the mentors that I would have had would not have been somebody that I could have related to at all. And it was, it was actually kind of heartbreaking because it was like, Oh, I want this job and this is so wonderful. But if I was here, I would leave in two years because I just don't have the support. And so I a hundred percent agree with Chad and I'm sure Jim will say the same that you need good mentors and good support um, because you weren't born doing orthopedic spine surgery and you definitely weren't born even after being a trained resident understanding how to take care of these people and to take care of your practice it's, it's very difficult well I, I also think it's what Jim said when he used the stool and av- uh, analogy you know you, there's no perfect job you're going to have to accept some compromises and you just try to get the best fit for you but I'm really happy to hear that all three of you have stated your places uh, since you finished, because that's nice. It's nice not to have to jump around and it's nice to be happy with your work. I mean, our work is stressful, but if you enjoy who you work with and certainly what we do, because we love our spine and we love making people better. So that makes it, you know, sort of the icing on the cake. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And just getting back to Jack's question, I, I'm the only spine guy in my practice and I'm the only orthopedic spine surgeon in the hospital. There's a couple of neurosurgeons that dabble in spine. Uh, it's definitely not their passion. So from my standpoint, it's, again, it's a double-edged sword. Um, I, I have a salaried position and I have a collections-based incentivized, you know, hit X number of collections, get this percentage of your case fees. And what I like about it is that I have a little bit more control on the faucet. I don't have anything trickled down from partners saying, hey, can you help me with Mrs. Jones with this terrible suit arthrosis. And oh, by the way, there was a durotomy and her BMI is 45. Um, so I don't have that part of it. But then again, you know, you're looking at this patient and it's, is this a two level ACDF? Is this a one level? What do I do about this? You know, is this pain that's in the dorsal forearm? Is that from six, five? Where, where am I going? And those things. So I really lean heavily on my co-fellows and all of my mentors at Emory. So I, I will have weekly conversations with them, uh, yeah, which I, I mean, found helpful. It's much different today. You take a few pictures on your iPhone, you send them to your friends or your mentors, 100%. and you get an instantaneous result. I mean, we all do it. I send pictures all around the world, uh, not only to my partners, if we have a tough problem and you get, you know, most people answer back pretty quickly. Unlike when I finished, I trained with Henry Bowman and I would send him x-rays that take two weeks to get there and then it'd take him two weeks to answer me. So it was like a six week ordeal, whereas now it's instantaneous. So that, that sort of takes the, uh, the sting out of practicing by yourself because you're really not by yourself. You always have lots of people around you. Yeah, I, I, I'm very fortunate to have the Rolodex I do. And I find that I trust a lot of those people and they're, they're just people that want to help out. And it's a great community. And that's one of the reasons doing something like this is just so wonderful because you can kind of build that same communal kind of understanding um, uh, in this process. It's hard not to think that you're the only one who doesn't know what you're doing. And so it is kind of nice to commiserate as well, you know, sending um, Todd and I have very fond uh, text messages as trading together. We all are in the same boat and it's nice to be going down uh, with the crew. Well, I think Jack Ziegler said it best. He said that a lot of things in spine are great. It's not, not a whole lot is black and white, except for, you know, certain traumas, but even that can sometimes be gray. 